welcome to our fresh episode of Legal Wrangle on Corporate Laws. Today, we are going to highlight two important decisions given by the Supreme Court of India relating to capital markets and competition laws. Let us begin with the recent and much talked about judgment of the Supreme Court in case of National Securities Depository Limited, wherein the issue was whether appeal before SAT can only be from quasi-judicial orders and not administrative or legislative orders or regulations framed by SEBI. That is whether an administrative circular issued by SEBI can be a subject matter of appeal under Section 15T of the SEBI Act or not. The SEBI issued one administrative circular under the caption Review of Dematerialization Charges under Section 11 Clause 1 of the SEBI Act to protect the interests of investors in securities and to promote the development of and to regulate the securities market. Depositories were advised by the said circular to amend all relevant bylaws, rules and regulations in order to see that with effect from 9 January 2006, no changes shall be levied by a depository on DPs and consequently by a DP on a beneficiary owner when a beneficiary owner transfers all securities lying in his account to another branch of the same DP or to another DP of the same depository or another depository, provided the BO account at transferee DP and that transferred DP are identical in all aspects. The National Securities Depository Limited filed an appeal against the said circular before the Securities Appellate Tribunal. The SEBI filed a preliminary objection stating that appeal to tribunal can only be from quasi-judicial orders and not administrative and legislative orders. This preliminary objection was turned down by the Securities Appellate Tribunal. According to the tribunal, the expression order is extremely wide and there being nothing in the act to restrict an appeal only against quasi-judicial orders, an appeal would lie against all three types of orders under the act, that is administrative orders, legislative orders as well as quasi-judicial orders. The tribunal therefore rejected the preliminary objection and went into the merits of the arguments against the impugned circular and dismissed the same. Cross appeals were filed before the apex court. The NSDL filed appeal on the merits of dismissal, whereas SEBI filed appeal against the rejection of the preliminary objection raised before the SAT. The Supreme Court gave an interesting decision in favour of SEBI by holding that the appeal to Securities Appellate Tribunal being a continuation of the proceedings before the board, such proceedings can only be quasi-judicial in nature. Structure of Section 15M of the SEBI Act suggests that the Appellate Tribunal being manned by a member of the higher judiciary is intended to hear appeal only against quasi-judicial orders. Appeal to SAT is to be filed within a period of 45 days. Generally, administrative orders and legislative regulations are never received personally by the person aggrieved. This again indicates that the order spoken of in subsection 1 of section 15T is only a quasi-judicial order. Copy of every order made by the appellate tribunal is to be sent to the board, the parties to the appeal and to the concerned adjudicating officer. The concerned adjudicating officer and the parties to the appeal obviously refer only to persons involved in a quasi-judicial proceeding. Under Section 15Z of the Act, an appeal lies from any decision or order of the Securities Appellate Tribunal to the Supreme Court on questions of law arising out of such orders. Obviously, these orders are also quasi-judicial in nature. So, in a nutshell, the Supreme Court dismissed the appeal of NSDL and SEBI's preliminary objection taken before the Securities Appellate Tribunal was upheld. However, liberty was granted to NSDL to take appropriate steps in judicial review proceedings to challenge the subject circular in accordance with law. Now, let's move on to our second case which pertains to Competition Act 2002. The key issue was whether Competition Commission of India can hold an inquiry under Section 3 of the Act in respect of the tender of March 2009, even though the Section 3 came into force on May 20th, 2009, wider notification and whether CCI investigation can be conducted even in respect of those facts which are not contained in the complaint, but which reveal agreements prohibited under Section 3 and have an appreciable adverse effect on competition. 
let's first understand the factual matrix one letter written by the food corporation of india to the competition commission of india complaining about cartel and anti competitive agreement purportedly arrived between messrs excel crop care limited messrs united phosphorus limited messrs sandhya organics chemicals private limited respectively the appellants and agro synth chemicals limited in relation to tenders issued by the food corporation of india for aluminium phosphide tablets of 3 grams for preservation of food grains between the years 2007 and 2009 the cci entrusted the matter to the director general for investigation who submitted his report prima facie findings affirming the allegations of the fci and the appellants had entered into an anti competitive agreement the dg apart from other things noted that the tender documents were usually submitted in person and the rates were normally filed with hand in respect of the tender floated in the year 2009 for procurement of fixed quantity of 600 megatons with a provision of up to 10% the three appellants had quoted identical rates of 388 after hearing the parties the cci passed the order and concluded that the appellants had entered into the anti competitive agreement in a concerted manner as a consequence it imposed penalty at the rate 9% on the average total turnover of these establishments for the last 3 years appeals were filed by the appellants before the compact the issue on merits was decided against the appellants by compact the present appeal questioned the validity of the order of the compact the cci also preferred civil appeal against that part of the impugned order whereby penalty imposed upon these suppliers was restricted to relevant turnover instead of total turnover section 3 is the first provision in chapter 2 of the act chapter 2 is titled as prohibition of certain agreements abuse of dominant position and regulation of combinations it starts by specifying those agreements which are prohibited under this chapter Though the Competition Act is of the year 2002 and was passed by the legislature on 13 January 2003 as per the provisions of section 13 the act was to come in force from the date to be notified by central government in the official gazette section 3 of the act along with many other provisions came into force on 20th May 2009 wide so 1241e dated 15 May 2009 on which date the said notification was published in the gazette of india as well remaining provisions were notified by subsequent notifications it is a unique example where the entire act was not enforced by one single notification but different provisions of the act were enforced in bits and pieces by issuing various notifications over a span of time the supreme court gave a landmark and very important decision that appellants being the only suppliers in the market for the product have indulged into cartelization when it is proved that they had been quoting identical prices in all tenders and had through concerted action by quoted one such tender section 3 operational by notification dated 20th may 2009 last date for submission of bids was 8th of may 2009 few days thereafter on 20th may 2009 section 3 of the act was notified merely because 8th may 2009 was the last date for submitting the tender would not be the end of the matter when the tendering process continued formation of cartel the investigation of dg revealed that the appellants had been quoting such identical rates much prior to and even after may 20 2009 no doubt in relation to tenders prior to 2009 it cannot be said that there was any violation of law by the appellants However, prior practice definitely throws light on the formation of cartelization by the appellants, thereby making it easier to understand the events of the 2009 tender. Penalty: The compact maintained the rate of penalty, that is, nine percent of the three years' average turnover. However, it was not agreed with the CCI that turnover mentioned in Section 27 would be total turnover. In its opinion, to it has to be relevant turnover. that is turnover of the product in question section 2 clause y which defines turnover does not provide any clarity to the aforesaid issue pertinently section 27b of the act while prescribing the penalty on the turnover neither uses the prefix total nor relevant 
Hence, taking aid of well-recognized principles of statutory interpretation, we have to determine the issue. It was found that adopting the criteria of relevant turnover will be more in tune with the ethos of the Act and the legal principles which surround matters of imposition of penalties. Even the doctrine of proportionality and doctrine of purposive interpretation would suggest that the court should lean in favour of relevant turnover. Thus, the order of the compact interpreting section 27b was upheld. The Supreme Court dismissed the appeal and penalty was imposed as decided by compact. The court held that conclusion of CCI that the appellants had entered into an agreement or arrangement and pursuant thereto indulged into collusive bidding by forming a cartel, resulting into contravention of Section 3 of the Act is justified. In case of multi-product companies, penalty under Section 27b cannot be levied on the total turnover and must be restricted to relevant turnover, that is, relating to the product in question. With this, we wrap up this episode of Legal Wrangle. Keep watching TIL Tube for upcoming videos. Please send in your queries or suggestions at editor at the rate tiol.in. Thank you for watching.